You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is award winning home builder, investment expert, published author, and philanthropist, Tom Lewis. Now, Tom is a seventh generation Kentuckian who grew up in Lexington. He graduated from the University of Kentucky in 1971 with a degree in mechanical engineering and went on to receive his MBA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Tom began his career in real estate development and after 18 years with four different companies and building upon those experiences, he started his own home building business in 1991 in Phoenix, Arizona. The T.W. Lewis Company built approximately 250 homes per year from 1991 through 2011 and received many awards during this period, including America's Best Builder and the National Housing Quality Gold Award. In addition to his real estate endeavors, Tom and his wife formed T.W. Lewis Foundation to support higher education, children and families in need, youth education, and a variety of community nonprofit organizations. And in this interview, Tom and I are going to cover a litany of topics, including the incredible value and leadership skills that he obtained while working in the corporate world prior to starting his own business. The important role a supportive spouse played in the overall success of his company. How he managed his business through one of the greatest recessions in history before selling it to David Weekly Homes. His strategy for not only finding talented team members, but more importantly, retaining those team members. How he prepped his company to exit to one of the largest home builders in the country. And much, much more. And so with that, guys, I'm super excited to get onto it with Tom. But before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items I want to run through here. And the first one here, just want to remind you of the new partnership program that we launched here over the past month or so called Bring Kevin a Deal. And this is where I will pay you as much as $200,000 for any mobile home park or parking lot deal that is referred to me that I end up purchasing. Now, to learn more about this opportunity and to download my deal acquisition criteria guide, you can go to bringkevinadeal.com. Again, that's bringkevinadeal.com. And guys, if you love what we're doing here at the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, please subscribe to the show. And also, if you haven't done so, leave a rating and review on iTunes. Uh, these reviews really help us attract awesome guests such as T.W. Lewis. And so if you haven't done so already, please, it takes just a few minutes. Please go leave that review and I would be eternally grateful. Uh, last thing here before we get rolling, I want to remind you of the free 30-minute phone call that I offer each and every week. This is where you can sign up to jump on the phone with me for 30 minutes. You can go to my website, kevinpup.com. There's no ulterior motives here. This is really just a way for me to connect and, uh, and to also act as a sounding board, hopefully give you some good sound advice on your, your real estate investing journey. And it doesn't matter whether you're brand new or seasoned. I'd love to chat with you. So again, go to my website, kevinpup.com. The only thing that I ask is when you're making that appointment, two things. Please include some notes of exactly what you'd like to chat about during our conversation. And the second thing, please show up at the scheduled time. And now, guys, without further ado, let's get on to the part of the show that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Tom Lewis. So here we go. All righty, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, renowned real estate developer, businessman, and philanthropist, Tom Lewis. Tom, how are you doing today? Hey, good, Kevin. Glad to be with you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here, and uh, you know, I've I've had a great deal of time to kind of dive into your background. Uh, you know, uh, spent some time on your website, very informative website, Tom, and uh, you've had quite the track record. Have started many different ventures uh, over the years, and so very excited to. Um, really t take a dive into, uh, you know, your businesses, uh, your philanthropic ventures and, and kind of everything that you've done over the last couple of decades. So just excited to have you here and thank you for spending the time with us here today. And so how I like to start this off, if we could, Tom, is uh, for those that aren't familiar with you that don't know your story, if, if I could pass the mic back to you, take a few minutes and just from a high level perspective, just tell us about your background, uh, you know, how you got into the real estate space and ultimately mm -hmm. some of the different things that you've done throughout the years in that space. <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm happy to do that, Kevin, and uh, I'm glad to be with your listeners today. Um, I guess I want to start with uh, <clears throat> my college education. You know, I grew up in Kentucky, went to the University of Kentucky. I'm a big wildcat, and uh, but I majored in engineering. Like most kids coming out of high school, I didn't have a clue. 
uh, I got a scholarship in engineering to my home state university and didn't even know what mechanical engineering was, but I majored in it. And uh, but two things I learned, one was math, and the other one is I didn't want to be an engineer. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I wanted to get away from engineering just as fast as I could, and uh, so I went straight to graduate business school. And it really took me four years of college as an active fraternity guy, and I, I'll say campus leader. I really, when I got to college, I wasn't ready to learn uh, <laughs> business. I was really ready to try to grow up a little bit and, and wanted to become a leader. And so I found those opportunities. You know, I like to quote that when a student is ready, a teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. You know, And so uh, the leadership teacher appeared in college, and I, and I got into that, <clears throat> and then I went sc uh, straight to graduate business school at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, a great B school, and uh, spent two years there, and that really is what put me in a position to win as a businessman. I think just that two-year education, not just the faculty who, was, who were fabulous, but also my classmates who yeah. were really uh, strong individuals themselves, <clears throat> and then uh, over a period of 40 years, I had uh, five jobs. You know, the first one, and, and I learned lessons along the way, and I'll run through this real quick. Mm -hmm. But my first job was with a big land development company, and they went broke in, in about two and a half years. And what I learned there was when you buy huge parcels of land and, and leverage them with a lot of debt and interest rates go up, you're dead meat. Okay, you cannot survive that. And so that's what the Sea Pines Company did back in the 70s, was bought large pieces of land and leveraged it and then um, had way too much overhead, but then they went bankrupt. And so then I went to the other end of the spectrum, and I'd met some home builders uh, in the process of doing land development, and I joined a large public home building company called Ryan Homes. And Ryan uh, really had good systems, and they had good cost control, but they didn't really take very good care of their customers or care about product quality. And so I learned some good lessons and some bad lessons. I learned their, their, their cost control systems and, uh, and the structure they provided, but I also learned how not to manage quality and customer satisfaction. And then I got another offer uh, to come out to Arizona that I took and uh, learned a few things about managing people and how, what's what's good and what's not so good. <clears throat> and then, uh, so at that point in my career, I, I knew a lot about land development and I knew a lot about home building. And uh, in land development, I learned about the, the, the danger of debt. And in home building, I learned about the power of cost control. Um, and then um, I joined Trammell Crow Company. I became a partner. But at that point, I really didn't understand finance. And I didn't really understand risk. Uh, as a as an entrepreneur, and now I was out there doing apartment deals and uh, began to understand that. And uh, we developed probably twenty five or thirty apartment projects over seven or eight years. And you 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 know through experience you learn the lessons of, of uh, commercial real estate and income real estate. And uh, and then uh, soon thereafter I started my own company. And we built our own office building, and so I managed and owned an office building for 20 years, and uh, wouldn't do that again myself. But uh, so you know, in a long career of, of real estate development, I've learned all the basic lessons I think, and uh, from cost control to to equity and debt, and uh, but I'd say most importantly to having a vision. You know, if you're going to start a company, you, you need to begin it with a vision and some values, and so that's. I, I guess I'd say that's my story. Uh, I, I appreciate that, that, that background. Uh, um, it really, again, helps lay the foundation and, and the groundwork here. And um, I, I want to back up a little bit. And, you know, you, you, you got on board with Trammell Crow and uh, initially were working um, on the multifamily development side of the business for, I think you had mentioned, seven or eight years or so uh, before actually uh, purchasing uh, you know, your partner's interest in their homes division. And so I know that you had worked for Ryan Homes. And so you had a lot of, a lot of experience on both sides of the table. What ultimately, you know, in talking to that vision, um, mm -hmm. what was the exact vision of uh, basically transitioning from the multifamily development side and actually 
becoming a home builder? What, what did that look yeah. like and, and what were your plans for that? Yeah. Well, you know, when I got out of uh, business school, when I was 24, I wrote down on a piece of paper, really, what my life dream was and what my vision was for my career. And that was to own my own company in the real estate business and have that company be based on the principles of quality and customer service, basically. Mm -hmm. and so somehow I knew that, or that was my, my North Star. That was my, I want, but mainly I think I wanted to own my own company. I didn't, uh, I didn't want to work for somebody else. You know, my, uh, I was a Navy brat. My dad was a career Navy officer. <clears throat> I didn't want to go that route, but I wanted the freedom I just knew that about myself. I had the individualistic values, and I wanted to own my own company. I knew that when I was in college. So, you know, but, of course, owning your own company takes a lot of money, and it also takes a lot of knowledge and experience. And so I certainly wasn't ready for that coming out of grad school. So I started getting that experience. And mm -hmm. uh, But I guess the, the, the advice I would give, though, is is work for good companies. You know, that that's... One thing I did right was I worked for really good companies. I would call all of them blue chip. You know, I mean, for their time, they were very sharp people, uh, you know, good good peers, good leaders. And so you learn good, you learn the right lessons when you're working for good companies with good mm -hmm. people. And, uh, and then I just kind of navigated the, uh, the different jobs and, uh, you know, and then look for opportunities. And, uh, you know, for example, when I was working for the, uh, you know, in the apartment business, I knew I wanted to start my own home company, home building company. Mm -hmm. So we did that with Trammell Crow. They would let partners do whatever they wanted. And then in about 1991, my seniors' partners uh, wanted to get out of the housing business. And so they told me if I wanted to take that operation and go with it, I was free to do that, and they'd work with me on it. So uh, that was kind of the, the opportunity that I was looking for. And uh, I like to tell people that, you know, when you're going down the freeway and you want to exit, you got to get in the right lane, you know, <laughs> to be, so that when the opportunity comes, you don't have long yeah. to, to think about it. You can, you can exit. And that's, yeah. that's what I did then because I knew kind of where I wanted to go. Yeah, no, no, that, that's great. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. The opportunity presented itself. Uh, you were prepared for it, at least, um, uh, you know, theoretically prepared for it, right? You had a lot of experience, but you had not owned your own business up to that point in time. And so the, right. the entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, vision that you had in grad school, now was, uh, it's, it's coming into a reality, right? And so mm -hmm. let's talk about some of those challenges uh, that, that you faced and how you overcame them. I mean, stepping into the really to the big boy shoes. I mean, now it's your own business. I mean, this is this is you. Uh, you either make or break that company, and so uh, ultimately, yeah. you made it. And uh, you, uh, you, you know, you you definitely fed a lot of families along the way of your employees and their families, mm -hmm. what have you. Yeah. you. You did something yeah. uh, really extraordinary. So, would love to uh, dissect that a little mm -hmm. bit if we could. Yeah. Well, a couple thoughts. One is, um, you know, being a leader. You know, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk out there about being a leader. <clears throat> Certainly, there's a, a lot of overlap between leadership and entrepreneurship, but um, I think they're two different things. But, but to, be, to be a leader, you first of all have to have a vision. And, and I learned that from working for companies that did not have visions. And I saw the damage that that did, both with customers and employees. When, you, when, when, when you're working for an owner, let's say an entrepreneur, and they don't have a good, worthy ideal or a good... Uh, North Star that is that is uh, uh, you know something worth respecting. I, I see how that uh, harms the employees and, and the customers. So I knew that to start a company, I had to have a, a worthy ideal. And so <clears throat> we came up with a vision statement that I think was one of the smartest things I've ever done. And the vision statement is that T. W. Lewis Company will become the best home builder in America as measured by product quality, customer satisfaction, and profitability. And that was a tall order for, you know, for, to begin a company with. But that was it. I mean, that was my vision statement. And we put that on the wall, literally, in the lobby. And then we came up with our six core values. And so our employees kind of knew what we stood for. And, uh, and then we got to work. And, uh, you know, I like to say that, you know, there's a lot of myths about, entrepreneurship, one of those myths 
is it's about great ideas. But I would choose to say it's really about constant improvement. Mm -hmm. You know, we started out, we were a total average company. But then we just kept getting better and better and better. And if you do that, you know, for 20 years, you're going to get pretty good at whatever <laughs> you're doing, you know. So, <laughs> right. What what did the the company look like when you purchased them, Trammell Crow? Um, you know, <clears throat> general, I guess, the size, number of homes built on average. Yeah, I don't know how you measured the home building business, but some of those yeah. key metrics that you would go by yeah. to ultimately where you ended up taking it. Yeah, well, it was probably a hundred homes a year mm -hmm. uh, back in nineteen ninety one, and uh, they were kind of uh, entry level houses, I would say, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we're probably doing thirty million a year in revenue, something like that. And uh, you know, fifteen years later, we were we were still doing about three hundred homes a year because we tried to limit our size. We didn't want to keep getting bigger. That's another myth about about entrepreneurship is you it's based on growth, and it's really not based on growth. To me, and this is a powerful point, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to own your own company, you have to figure out your own capacity. And some people are designed to run, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos was, has the capacity to manage a massive operation. You know, I didn't. I, I had the capacity to pay attention to a lot of details and run, you know, a 300 house a year company. And that was, but I didn't want to travel. I didn't want to have five layers of management. I didn't want to, I wanted to be hands on. And so it, I had to build my own company around my capacity and also, equally important, my talent, you know, because every, you can't be like somebody else. You have to be authentic, and that's the, that's the key word. And so that takes a lot of failures and a lot of self-awareness to figure out what it is, what is it about you that is talented and authentic, because when you try to be someone else, you usually fail. You know, there, there's only one of each of us, and we have to become that best our best self so mm -hmm. so that's that that's what the company looked like when I started it was small it probably had 20 employees and uh, it was doing 100 homes a year and then we built it into really a dominant high-end high quality uh, strong brand company that only that only built in one market mm. wow and then I, I won all kinds of national awards and uh, the national housing quality yeah. And I believe you had a successful exit sometime. I think it was 2011 or 12, if I, if I recall, yeah. but, and, we, and we can get into that, but you hit on a very important point that I think that I want to reemphasize and maybe we dive a little deeper on it. It's about understanding what your own capacity is, uh, what your own bandwidth is and, and having the self-awareness to do so. The self-awareness part, I, I mean, I think that is a, it, it's a fairly significant challenge for a lot of new entrepreneurs, gosh, even seasoned entrepreneurs. And I think the the misnomer that bigger is always better. And, uh, and you really sounded like you were incredibly self-aware that, you know, it, it, bigger did not mean better, right? You wanted to build a very sustainable company, something that mm -hmm. um, was built to your own specs, the specs of, of mm -hmm. what you wanted to ultimately have as your lifestyle, you know, and, and whatever that means to you, right? You didn't want to travel. Um, you had a family. I'm sure you had you know, children that you were raising and things of that nature. And you, you, you wanted to be mm -hmm. present. You wanted to be hands-on within the company. And, and um, I, I tell you that I, I share very similar values to that. And um, it's interesting, even in our space where we're at, there's, you know, uh, different tiers of companies uh, as far as size. We've got publicly traded companies all the way down to you know, just single asset operators. And then, you know, we kind of fall in the middle there. And uh, my self-awareness came at a point shortly after the uh, the recession of 2008. I had a very challenging time with a lot of my real estate investments going through um, two or three years following that and really went into a, a, a redesign mode. Uh, at, at that point during the recession, I was not married. I did not have children. However, uh, shortly thereafter, I did get married and our plans were to have children. And what I, what I did know is that I, I didn't desire to I don't want to use the word work as hard as I had the prior, I guess, decade when I was younger building my first company. Um, but I wanted to be more efficient with my time. And I wanted that, that time efficiency to allow me to spend time with my new wife and to spend time with my future kids, right? And actually be around, be present for them. Um, 
you know, one of the biggest lessons I've learned from folks that were my senior um, that, that, that mentored me through the early stages of my business were, I, well, the biggest regret, I guess I'll, I'll put it as that, the biggest regret, if I had to take one and say that it was the majority of the folks that had mentored me over time was that they were so busy and so focused on growing a big company in their early stages of, of their business, you know, it, when they were, you know, you know, new fathers, that they weren't present for their kids. They weren't around and they missed the first 10 years or 12 years of their children's life and they can never get that back. And I knew that I, I, I absolutely never wanted to actually mm-hmm. have that same regret come out of my mouth. And so that became, yeah. that, that yeah. made me incredibly we, self-aware. Yeah. You know, uh, when I started my company, when, actually when I started my career, when we first started having children after we got married we have three sons they're all great young men but you know i had that same problem we all have you know you first get married your career is important your mm-hmm. family's important but i decided that there would only be three things i could i could be good at and one of them was going to be my business okay, i was committed these were the three things i was committed to first you know i'll, I'll say my business okay and equally i'll say my family I was not going to sacrifice anything for either one of those things, okay? And then the third one was my health. And, and actually that, by health, I really meant take time to exercise because if I didn't, for me, if I didn't exercise, I didn't have the energy to do either. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I exactly. exercised for kind of sanity and energy. <laughs> and that's what kept me sane so that I could function and do all that was needed. So I almost never missed a family dinner. I never missed a kid's football, baseball, basketball. I coached them throughout Little League. Uh, I worked like a dog, and I exercised almost every day. And, and I didn't do anything else, though. That's the point. You, you can't be all things to all people. So I didn't hang out with my friends. I didn't play a ton of golf. I didn't do – there wasn't room for anything else when you're – starting a company and raising children. There, mm-hmm. there is zero yeah. room. You know that, right? <laughs> so, yeah. but we've all, we know some of us have been there, but you have to pick and choose. You have to make decisions. You can't be all things. Um, I think social media hurts us mm-hmm. these days, hurts young people because they're constantly distracted by what somebody else is doing and what somebody else is, looks like and, and all that. And that is just such a distraction. I didn't have to bother with that. Let's talk to that. What advice would you give you know the younger entrepreneurs that that are? I think that there's a major issue with social media and, and com, you know the comparing yourself to others, right? Kind of measuring yourself yeah. against uh, the others that yeah. probably half those posts aren't even real, right? I mean, it's, they're not yeah. authentic posts. Yeah. They're in, there's a lot of inaccuracies there that you can't mm-hmm. you don't mm-hmm. know, right? Because whatever's posted is real, correct? <laughs> so what advice would you give a younger entrepreneur that, uh, that, that is having those challenges? Because I think they're, they're, they're incredibly real. Well, there's a few quotes I, ha- I like on that. <clears throat> One of them is, um, how does that go? Uh, Envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. Okay. And then another one is never envy someone you don't know well. Okay. Never envy someone you don't know well. Because if you think about it, do you, is there anyone that you know well that you envy? No. no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's it. So, I love that so quote. The point is, once you get to know someone well, you, we all have our problems, you know? So only on social media and in Hollywood are there perfect people, okay? <laughs> so you just have to realize that uh, you can't get, you know, distracted by that. And, uh, uh, you know, and you have to be authentic, you know, what some, and then the other one is envying someone you don't know well is the opposite of self-awareness, okay? It's really, so Hmm. this idea of self-awareness is really knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, what are you good at, what do you like, what do you not like, and then trying to, and then we all have biases, okay? Hmm. Because our strengths and our our weaknesses create biases that inform and, and control our decisions, so we have to be careful there, you know? Um, so just becoming an entrepreneur is a, a, a very complex subject, and uh, but you have to know yourself when you get into it. And even there are certain personality traits that correlate strongly with an entrepreneur, and the strongest one, I would say, is dominance, you know, mm-hmm. and assertiveness. You have to be 
And when you're dominant, you're kind of a problem solver and you have to be assertive because you have so many obstacles that you have to just plow through. If you're afraid of that, you'll never make it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, no, all, all great points. I, I appreciate that, Tom. And I, I, I want to make sure that we don't gloss over this one. And it's, um, y- y- you know, as you were building your company, lo- lots of things going on. But, you know, one of the, uh, the key aspects of, of actually building a successful company, you know, b- being, a, uh, you know, a, a leader and, and leading folks in the right direction. But, you know, the initial stages of that, you need someone to lead, right? So attracting the right talent, you know, getting the right butts in the right seats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talk, talk to me about that. Talk to me about you know, through the growth stages of your company. Um, how are, you know, what did you do differently than your competitors to attract the right, not just attract the right talent, but it's mm-hmm. also about retaining the right talent. Yeah, you know, I'd say one of the things that you won't hear much about out there in terms of how to build a company is, and I think I did right, was you start with a good, clear, worthy ideal. And I would call that, uh, you know, you call that your vision statement. But it's a, it has to be a noble one, a noble ideal. It can't be, we're going to make as much money as possible, as fast <laughs> as possible. You know, that, sure. that, that's not going to motivate your employees. It's also not going to attract good ones, okay? Yeah. So you have to have a noble idea, like we want to become the best at something, or we want to solve this market problem for the benefit of our customers and our employees and our community, or something like that. It has to be noble. And then when you clarify your values, like we did, which were the, my core values, I'll say, which were then and still are honesty, integrity, hard work, reliability, compassion, and achievement, you know, I can say those in my sleep. So we put those on the wall, and not only do we put them on the wall in big letters, we defined them. Mm-hmm. You know, hard work was doing the job right the first time with a good attitude. You know, and so we defined them. And so what we said was these are our core values as a company. And <clears throat> I never had one employee over 20 years disagree with any of those values because, you know, I mean, but, but people, employees, want leadership, and, they, and that is leadership, to say this is, our, this is what we stand for, these are our high-minded ideals, and these are our, but, but this is the way we're going to behave as a, as, a, as a team. And so uh, that really became a competitive advantage in the housing business because none of our competitors had anything like that. <clears throat> and then when we said we wanted to focus on quality and customer satisfaction, I knew from working for big home building companies how tough that was on employees when your company didn't do that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Because I was the guy for years that had to deal with all the unhappy customers. <laughs> and that does not make going to work fun. You know, that makes that's that's miserable, you know. Dealing with hope you know, with housewives that are ready to <laughs> chop your head off because of their kitchen floors, sure. you know. So I learned the price of, of bad quality. And so, but doing things like that attracts the strong people. It attracts people that want to commit to a cause. And, uh, and they like that. I mean, people, so that, that was one of the things we did. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's great. And as you built this company, I know that, again, you, you had an exit to, uh, to David, and we- David Weekly Homes. Uh, as you were building this company, were you building it uh, – under the premise that, um, you know, ultimately one day you would exit out by selling out or, you know, not selling out's a wrong phrase because it has mm-hmm. a negative connotation, yeah. but you get what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Um, were you building yeah, no. it, building <clears throat> it to sell is the best way to put it. I really wasn't. I never mm-hmm. built it to sell it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's another thing I would, I would say to you, uh, that you have to commit to things, you know, and this idea that, you know, I'm going to start a company uh, pitch the investors, uh, run up the revenue, and sell it. You know, I mean, th- th- there are a lot of entrepreneurs that that's their business model, you mm-hmm. know, and, and and that's what they're good at, and there's really nothing wrong with that. Okay, but for me, I was kind of a long-term guy, and I think the entrepreneur space or the word has kind of uh, been given some 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 bad uh, implications, in that really. I would call myself not just an entrepreneur. I would call myself a long-term entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And those were the kind of people that I admired, people that started a company from scratch, 
made it authentic, and then tried to create a, a company that could last forever. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, you know David Weekly, the, the the company that I sold my company to, is that kind of a company. For me, it just didn't work out that way. You know, our sons were not interested in it. Um, I wasn't really interested in passing it on to my own children. And then I ended up having cancer uh, about that time. And that kind of sidetracked me for a few years, which I'm now over, thank goodness. But it just didn't work out for me. And then the then the 2008 crunch hit, and that took all the fun out of it, honestly. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, that just, I mean, I'm that right just, there with it, you. <laughs> and from two that from 2007 to 2011, it was just brutal. It, I mean, going to work every day was just one piece of bad news after another for four years. So. I was just ready to move on, and then I got involved in philanthropy, and that became my new, my new, uh, my new company, really. Yeah, no, and I, I definitely want to talk about that, and I think that, uh, yeah, the, the years between 2008 and 2011, about the only thing positive that happened in my life was I just happened to meet my now wife, um, literally uh, within weeks of defaulting on millions upon millions of dollars of uh, of real estate. So it was a very positive, shining light in a, a very dark, dark place uh, for a period of, of, of a, about about three years, really, um, just mm-hmm. a really messy situation. So I can I can relate to a certain extent. <laughs> Um, yeah. and so, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting that, you know, it, it really ties into the, you know, to the philanthropic side of things. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, during that period of time in my life, I was very out of my, my finance, my finances were very out of control. Like I literally so out of control that, um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't get stability there in that part of my life. I just, it was, there was so much going on, so much turmoil. It was just going to take time to kind of run its course. The only thing I could control was how I felt and ultimately what I did as a person, you know, not in the business, but what I did as a person. And so, you know, health became even more important to me then. But one of the other things that um, that's become a big part of my life was um, my philanthropic activities. And so I didn't have any money at that point. I was basically broke. But what I did do is I, I you know, the things that, um, that I had always participated in, there was a lot of different groups I volunteer with. But one um, that was near and dear to my heart was um, through a close friend of mine, started the foundation where we basically uh, provided meal baskets and food for uh, for you know, uh, um, families here in the local area, you know, hundreds of them every every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, and so he also was a real estate developer, went absolutely broke, and so this foundation, um, which he used to self fund, now uh, had had no money to basically feed these families, and so I. I'm a, a cycling, cycling is one of my hobbies. And so I basically, I started that year. And well, in 2010, I started what is known today as uh, the 72 hours of Key West uh, charity bike ride and uh, started doing something with my body that could basically give yeah. back and help others. Although I had no money myself to give, uh, yeah, but I had, sure. had my energy and my passion and, and what have you. And so it's, mm-hmm. you know, now we've, We've mm-hmm. given, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars fed, you know, hundreds of families or thousands of families throughout the yeah, years. And uh, uh, it sounds like during that period of time, you probably, you know, I had a lot of self-reflection during those challenging times. And it sounds like you had mm-hmm. probably a very similar period of your life there during the recession and years thereafter mm-hmm. where you started, you just had a lot more um, time to, to spend thinking about what does the future really look like here? Because this is kind of losing its luster to a certain extent. You know, mm-hmm. bad news every day is not fun going into you know, the office and, and only hearing about all the mm-hmm. negative things. And so let's talk about the uh, you and your wife kind of entering into your philanthropic journey. What, what's that look like? And, and um, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, how do you guys give back? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, we started in 2001. And somewhere I read about somebody, or I might have been shopping, I think, and I saw a shoebox that had something on the bottom of the shoebox that said, this company donates 10% of their revenues to charity. Mm-hmm. And that just kind of struck me. I thought, wow, that's a cool idea, you know. <clears throat> uh, and then when I turned 50, I thought about sell- I thought about selling my company, you know, you know, get out, you know, live the good life. And... Um, but then uh, I thought, well, what, what am I going to do? And then, then I came to, and I kind of went through a little midlife crisis, and then, which, ha- which will happen when you turn 50, by the way. I'm just going <laughs> to warn did, you about that. Did you get a red sports car? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, but, you know, when, you're, when your kids start going away to college, and, and it just, it's, it's, you kind of get down. I think yeah. a lot of people do. But I did. 
and then um, so I I, did, well, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, and then I uh, I decided, look, what I need to do is keep doing what I'm good at, and then I can take some of the money I'm making and give it away, and that way, you know, I'm a Christian, and I thought mm -hmm. that's a good way for me to kind of satisfy God's calling for my life. You mm -hmm. know, so I'm going to keep doing what I'm good at. But it's not going to be for me. It's going to be for other people. And so that's what we started doing. So we started our foundation, and we immediately got into uh, giving scholarships to kids. And my wife and I would interview about 30 or 40 kids every spring. And I'd spend wow. an hour with each kid one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I really enjoyed that. It was fun. These kids were really sharp. And you know they were, they were bright and capable but had, need, had a financial need. Mm -hmm. And we sent them to the best colleges in America for a long time. And that was really meaningful, and that, that, then that just got us started. And then we get, got involved with uh, ch other children and families in, in need, poverty, domestic violence, foster children, things like that. Then we got into educating kids in, in character development, and then uh, all kinds of other community and medical uh, things. And, and now we uh, focus on uh, national uh, causes as well. So we're in a we're, – we're, very involved in a lot of different categories, but uh, you know, they, I get a lot of pleasure out of it. So no, that's, that's fantastic. What, what, what are some um, some of the things you've learned along the way as far as vetting uh, different causes? Uh, you know, I think one of the uh, you know the, the folks that you're know, moving into that the, the philanthropic th philanthropic part of their life, or you know, adding it to that you know that part of their life, mm -hmm. is they you know there's a it gets overwhelming when you actually really start diving into the many different causes that are, are in great need. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the vetting process, uh, you know, in and of itself is a, uh, is a job. And so are there any, any secrets, any tips, any wisdom that you could share as far as vetting various causes and, you know, ultimately selecting one out of a thousand? Yeah. You know, so <clears throat> I take, uh, you know, when I was in college, there were two words that really got me excited. And, and when I would interview these high school kids, I would ask them what, what they wanted to be when they grew up. And they would always say things like, I love biology and I'm good in statistics, so I want to be a, a statistical biologist. Okay? So, but there were two words. that, And my guess if I ask you that right now, Kevin, what are your two words that just get you excited? <laughs> you know, you, it, it might be, uh, I don't know what they'd be. You know, I have no idea what they'd be. But um, I think, think about it and maybe you'll come up, you will, you will, will come up with it. Yeah. What, what are they? I'd say family, family is the first one by far. And, um, yeah. And helping others, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, if I had yeah. to pick just two, it may be family and, and helping others yeah. succeed, helping others succeed. And which is a yeah. big part of this podcast. Yeah. I mean, it's the reason why I started yeah. it and I yeah. really well, enjoy it. Honestly, I, I, and I'll plug my book right now. That's why I wrote solid ground, the foundation mm -hmm. for winning and working in life was to help other people succeed because I've always loved help pe helping people with their careers. But I found that there's always two words that, that you loved as, as a child. And they, my two words were construction and investment. When I was in college, whenever I would hear either one of those words, my ears would just perk up. You know, it's like, you know, and, I, and they still do. Okay, I love those two words. But, but so when I look at philanthropy, I don't look at it as giving away money any more than, than you would look at buying an apartment complex and giving away money. I look at it as in, as investing, you know, and so and then I, I typically like a long term relationship you know, with the the pe you have to like the people you have to respect the people the leadership the vision, um, and then and so it's not really kind of vetting them so who do, who do you make the check out to I think it's really like like you did with your uh, bicycle food fund rate or f food drive, you know. The, the value of philanthropy is getting engaged with it. You know, that's, what, that's exactly what you did. If you just write a check, it, there's not a lot of pleasure that comes back. Yeah. But if you get to know the people, if you look them, if you get to know them, I mean, if you, if you deliver the food to their front doors and, mm -hmm. and spend a few minutes to talk to them, that's where the real, uh, yes. the real value is there. And so that's what we try to do as much as we can is get to know the people. 
No, that, that, that is great, great insight there. So really just getting involved and, uh, and playing a role in, in causes yeah. that are near and dear to your heart and actually uh, yeah. you know, f- feeling the passion through the, the founders and the other volunteers, what have you. Yeah. So I, that, that's, that's beautiful. I love it. I love every bit of it. You yeah. know, let's, let's talk more about the book, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I love maybe get some additional insights as to what, you know, folks could expect, you know, uh, by, by grabbing a copy of the book and reading it. And then also mm-hmm. another question I have is, you know, about the monumental task of actually writing a book, you know, what did that look like and how'd you overcome wow. that feat? <laughs> yeah, it took about, it took four years and I'm, I'm guessing about 2000 hours. So maybe mm-hmm. a quarter of my time for four years. But, uh, I certainly didn't know that when I got into it initially, I thought I could just sit down and, and have somebody interview me and then turn it into a book. And there you go, you know, but, but actually the, 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 the pain and suffering that I had to go through to write that book really is what, created all the, the the value and what made it enjoyable and meaningful for me, you know. But um, <clears throat> so I started off writing this book for a couple reasons. One is that having interviewed hundreds of high school kids back in the early 2000s uh, for scholarship uh, opportunities, I began to see a change in young adults, and they were b- being fed a bunch of bad advice and, and myths. And I guess the first one is follow your passion do what you love and live your dreams and everything else will just work out, you know. And then you start hearing things like work smarter, not harder. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, and I, I'm kind of a hard work, you know, uh, shoulder to the grindstone kind of a guy. But I thought kids were actually beginning to believe that stuff. And, uh, you know, I know when I was 18, I had no clue what my passion was. I'm, I'm, I think I have a fair idea now, but your passion changes constantly. You know, yeah. before you had kids, you had a different passion than now that you have kids, you know. And so your passion changes. What mm-hmm. doesn't change is your talent, you know. And your, your, your innate talent is something that is that we all have that's different. And so the key to success is finding that talent and developing it and practicing and practicing and, and honing your, your natural talent. You know, the Michael Jordan analogy mm-hmm. is the best one. He had all the metrics, you know, and, and the speed and the size and everything. But it was the hard work that really separated him from everyone else. So you find your talent and you really work hard at that. And uh, so that's why I wrote the book. The other reason I wrote the book is that I'll call it a success book. Most of the success books that are out there tend to simplify success. You know, a good example of that would be Grit. Grit's a good book, but, you know, the, the implication is, is there's just one thing that it takes to be successful, and that's grit, you know. And it's, it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. Sure. So in, so in the book, I, in the first five chapters, I tell my journey. And I do that because I think we all have our own unique journeys. And I think when people read it, and a lot of people have read it already, they begin to think about their journey. And, uh, and so it's kind of like, where, am I, where have I been? Where am I going? And then uh, the next five chapters are what I would call the foundation for success, which are really those things that put you in a position to win and stop you from losing. Mm-hmm. Okay? And those are, uh, first of all, personal character, hard work, goal setting, self-awareness, and helping others. Mm-hmm. Helping others is one of my five so that, that creates a foundation that if you have those virtues and you practice and keep trying to get better in those areas, you now are in a position to win. And then it's kind of like if you're a, a – I'm from Kentucky. I'm thinking about horse racing. You know, to win a horse race, the, the first job is, is to be in a position to win when you hit the home stretch, okay? And then – and same, and same in football, you know. All the you hear coaches talking about being in a position to win. You have to do everything right just to be in a position to win. And then winning is a whole nother thing. Winning takes confidence, but in business it takes good decision making, it takes smart risk taking, uh, and it takes execution. And so those are all things that require a lot of experience, uh, a lot of failures. You know, the whole idea of learning from failures is a beautiful thing because no one succeeds without learning from failures. You know, just, and so if you don't have, if you don't take the risk that lead to the failures, 
you never learn the lessons that you need to learn in order to take the next step. And so I think a lot of young people today are, are risk averse and that's holding them back. Uh, so you've got to, and you don't want to be stupid about it. Obviously you want to take smart risk. You want to mitigate your risk, but you have to take risk. Yep. No, I absolutely agree. And we didn't mention the name of the book. So the book is, guys, the, the title of the book is Solid Ground, A Foundation for Winning in Work and in Life. And um, Tom, where, where can listeners, where can they find a copy? Where can they grab a copy? What's the best place yeah, to go? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, they can go to our website. It's solidgroundbook.com. And then it's also on Amazon. Uh, it's doing very well on Amazon. It's in hardback, ebook, and audiobook. Wow. And, uh, Did you narrate the so audio book yourself? And, and I personally narrated the book, and that was another <laughs> That's 20 a feat, hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's good. It's really good. I think, uh, I think anybody I'd recommend it, mm -hmm. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. And it's whether you spend $10 or $30 on it, I guarantee it's worth a thousand times that. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I've been, I'm, I'm about a little over two years into writing my book. So and I thought it was going to be yeah. done in about six months. So uh, <laughs> my, my hopes are that I can get it wrapped up here in the next four months. I think I'm about 90% of the way there, but that probably really, that really means I'm probably really? like 70% of the way there. <laughs> Maybe 20%. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Well, Tom, this has been an absolute delight having you on the show. And uh, what I love to do here is I love to roll into what we call the golden nugget segment. And this is where we'll, you know, look to wrap up the show. And, um, you know, you've shared a lot of golden nuggets along the way, lots of great information, lots of phenomenal insights of your many decades of being in business. And, but if you just had one final gold nugget of advice or wisdom that you can leave with our listeners here today that might inspire and motivate them as they progress in their own real estate investing career, what would that one last gold nugget be? Well, <clears throat> I don't have to think very long for that. It would be this, show up, have a plan, and commit. And there's a quote there that says 80% of the people, you can be successful 80% of the time if you just show up. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean work hard. 80% of the time, that's all it takes. Yep, yep. I love it. If I you, love If you show up and have a plan, you can be successful 90% of the time. And if you show up, have a plan, and commit, it's 100%. Yeah. And that's it. No, I love it. Tom, this has been an absolute pleasure. Guys, if you want to learn more about Tom and uh, his company, his philanthropic ventures, everything that he has going on, everything he's done, you can go visit his website. It's twlewis.com. Again, that's twlewis.com. And, and Tom, I do believe that on that on your T.W. Lewis uh, primary website, they can also see a link to the book there as well, right? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Well, so thank you again, Tom, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Oops. My pleasure and same to you, Kevin. Great to meet you. Well, Thank guys, you. That's, that's all we have for this week's show. I appreciate you tuning in. And until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bob, wishing you huge success. You guys take care now. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. And we'll see you next Monday morning.